This morning, I'm going to take you on a tour of Matthew's uh, publications, the newspapers that he published in over the course of his 50-year career from age 12 at 1825 until, uh, say, 1875. I'm only going to show you the ones I have physical copies of. For those of you who are especially interested in the famous authors that seem to have plagiarized Matthew's work, I'm going to touch on some of those things, but this isn't going to primarily be about that. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to go in date order, but I'm going to start with the Portland transcript. This is a paper that, it's the first one that I discovered because Matthew is known historically to have published Ethan Spike, the satirical anti-slavery pieces. Um, in the transcript, and as it happens, he started with the transcript in maybe 1841, and uh, the very last piece I found is also in the transcript in 1875, so this spanned a good bit of his career. This is just an example of what it looked like in 1855. This is the March 3, 1855 edition. Trying to get the light reflection off of that. I'm going to just have to kind of put them down next to me here. This is what it looked like in uh, 1844, going back. And here is what it looked like in 1840. So you can see how it got a little bit fancier over the years. Now here's an example from December 5, 1846. But in this paper, there's a smoking gun regarding Edgar Allan Poe and the Raven. There's a bunch of these that Matthew uh, slipped into his legacy. And this one in particular is in outraged response to Poe's compilation, uh, The Raven and Other Poems. On the second page, this is very fragile, it's about ready to come apart. I'll get a close-up shot of it. It's just about ready to split into two. On the second page, we see a fragment written for the transcript from the unpublished history of Libbyville by Spike. So this is definitely one of Matthew Franklin Whittier's Ethan Spike stories. But instead of telling a story about Hornby, which is where Ethan Spike came from, this one is about Libbyville, situated down east, which means where I am here in Maine. And uh, the reason I think he did that is that he was primarily writing Ethan Spike for the Boston Chronotype. He switched over in this particular instance and wrote it for the Portland Transcript. And I think he switched towns and didn't specifically talk about Ethan Spike because I think he had a gentleman's agreement with the editor of the Chronotype, Elijah Wright, to, to make it exclusive for the chronotype. So it's clearly the same person in the same series, but he's he's gotten a little bit away from Ethan Spike and Hornby. So in this town of Libbyville, it has just incorporated. It's just gotten big enough to incorporate, and suddenly they've gotten a, a big head. Suddenly they feel like they're, they're big stuff now that they're incorporated. And this is a metaphor for Edgar Allan Poe, who thinks he's hot stuff. See, this is Matthew's Matthew's view of Edgar Allan Poe is that he's an imposter, literary imposter, that he's created himself out of thin air. I've got other examples where he indicates this too. He's hyped himself up, in other words, primarily by stealing other people's poetry. So this is like, he's a phony. You know, this is what people don't understand because they can't believe it's so extreme. They can't believe this guy literally built himself up out of nothing by stealing other people's poetry and then becoming a critic, which ratcheted him up to a, a level of where he could now uh, be above other writers or on the same level as other writers because he was a critic. See? So it's all phony. Well, anyway, at the end of this story, he says, Then it was that a latent spirit of ambition and pride, which in the language of Deacon Daniel Libby, had, quote, hitherto lain dormouse, began to manifest and to mightily exalt itself, unquote. The Meetness, Meeting House, was newly painted, a town pump established, etc., etc. In other words, this town of Libbyville started to really get ideas about itself. 
Well, that's fine. I mean, you could say that was intentional or not intentional, but when you juxtapose these things like Matthew did, then you see what he was getting at. Immediately under that article is a quote from Quarles, Francis, the poet Francis Quarles. And you know that when Matthew submitted The Raven to American Review, he signed blank Quarles. I've talked about that already. So here is deliberately a quote from Francis Quarles. Here it's misquoted. They left out a section which takes the teeth out of it, which is very strange. But if you read the whole quote, the intent is very clear. And he has Quarles basically saying in so many words that, uh, well, Poe may think he's a moral person, which he said in his philosophy of composition. So he may think he's a moral person, but he's no Christian. You know? <laughs> so basically he's saying that Poe is not really moral or religious. He's a worldly man. He's no Christian at all. Now keep in mind that Poe published a great many Christian sounding poems by grieving widowers. You know, he stole the poetry of unknown grieving widowers who had not published the poems and published them under his own name. That was his MO. So when the when the full extent of Poe's phoniness comes to light, I think it's going to be a huge shocking paradigm shift to an awful lot of people. Uh, but anyway, be that as it may, that's going to be one of many, many pieces of evidence that's in the article that will be coming out sometime in the middle of this year in Real Paranormal Magazine. So I'm going to put that down. Now we go in date order. Matthew began publishing for the New England Galaxy in Boston as a boy of 12 in 1825. Not too long after that, he ran away from home and spent his time between Boston and New York City. It's hard to trace exactly where he was. This is the earliest piece with Matthew's work in it that I have. This is the December 16, 1825 edition when Matthew was 13 years old. And there's a couple pieces by here. I've presented this before in these blogs, so I won't read everything that I'm showing you. We're just getting an overview now. So that's Matthew as a 13-year-old boy in the New England galaxy. And it's pretty sophisticated stuff for 13. Matthew was not the only child in that era who began a career as a child that early. There were others. So it's not really that outrageous for me to claim that. He's not the only one. Now, when Matthew finished writing for the Galaxy, he was also writing for a New York City paper early on, the um, New York Inquirer. He was also writing for, for the Berkshire American in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, under Asa Green. When Asa Green moved to New York and opened a bookstore and launched another newspaper, The Constellation, this was in late 1829, Matthew went up there not long after it was established and began writing for that paper while he was also pursuing a mercantile career in New York City. But before too very long, in 1830, he was the junior editor. Even though he's never mentioned anywhere, I'm 100% sure that Matthew was writing as the junior editor. In fact, he was basically running the paper, as near as I can tell. He was publishing his brother, John Greenleaf Whittier's poetry. He was publishing his friend, Oliver Wendell Holmes' poetry. Uh, he published some prose pieces by John Greenleaf Whittier. So he was trying to give his brother a leg up in a New York City paper. This is what the constellation looks like. And uh, I've touched on this several times. I won't go into it. I have about five copies of this thing. What we see on the front page, covering most of the front page on this one, is an extended excerpt of John Greenleaf Whittier's Legends of New England. So again, I think John Greenleaf Whittier at this point was publishing in the local paper, you know, in uh, Massachusetts, in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Matthew was giving him national exposure. So the people that run the Whittier legacy have no idea of the re real literary relationship between these two brothers. Matthew helped give him his start, even though he was five years younger. Now, in uh, 1832, there was a terrible cholera epidemic. Matthew eventually left New York City. He wrote five books during the period of 1833 and 1834. 
which scholars mistakenly believe were Asa Green's books. Asa Green helped him get them published. He helped them get the copyright there in New York, but helped him get the copyright. But Asa Green didn't write any of those books. We're talking uh, The Debtor's Prison and uh, A Yankee Among the Nullifiers and The Perils of Pearl Street. Uh, um, let's see, uh, Travels in America, I think it is. Anyway, there's, there's five books that Matthew wrote, good, good little books. And uh, the, the Life and Adventures of Dr. Dotemus Duckworth, those are all Matthew's work. Then, in 1834, Matthew began writing for Asa Green's third newspaper. His next newspaper was, was the New York Transcript. Primarily for the transcript, he was writing what they call the police office, which is, I guess today we would call it the blotter. You know, when people are arrested and they come in and they're arraigned, he would write up. Well, he wrote these things in a, in a very, I mean, he was still a Quaker at this point. So they're morality tales and they're humorous. It's black humor and morality tales is what he wrote. He, he used real names, you know, back in 1834. Here's one right on the back of this, so I'll, maybe I'll read a little bit of it to give you an idea. This is also attributed to another reporter, a printer, a typesetter from England, who began working for this paper. And historians, because they don't have any mention of Matthew's name whatsoever, they assume that these things were written by this fellow who'd never written anything before in his life, which is nonsense. Matthew had been publishing at this point for nine years. <laughs> this, this, this happens over and over and over. Matthew created a vacuum. And both nature and academia abhor a, vac a vacuum. So they assign these pieces to somebody because they're so good, they have to assign them to somebody. Matthew's completely erased from the history, except for Ethan Spike. And so they assign them willy-nilly. Even if nobody claimed his pieces, the scholars step in and assign them to just whoever happens to be handy. This happened over and over. So this was not, I forget the guy's name, William something. I forget his name now. It's in my book. He did not write most of these, certainly not the, the, the ones that have creativity to them. So I'm going to start. In italics, seduction, slaughter, sickness, and suicide were the order of the day at the police office yesterday morning. The magistrate's desk was strewed with pocket pistols, horse pistols, dirks, knives, bullets, and other warlike instruments. Remember, this is a Quaker writing. The floor of the outer room was strewed with drunkards and debauchees, and the inner room contained within its precincts two or three interesting-looking victims of some interesting, it's like a, it's used differently back in the 19th century. It's kind of a, I can't explain how it's used, but it doesn't mean it in the light sense. It's, it's a little bit colloquial. Interesting is like a euphemism. Interesting-looking victims of some reckless libertine while the back room was scarcely sufficient to contain a swarthy Spaniard named, I'm having to read through the plastic, Marnell or Marmel Epinosa, who first attempted to blow out his own brains and then threatened to murder those who prevented him. He was brought up for having threatened to shoot a Mr. Young. They both boarded at Niblo's and had a dispute about some money and papers when the threat was made. The Spaniard slept with a loaded pistol under his head and was taken in bed by Smith and Collins, who were the uh, policemen. He was bailed out by the Spanish consul. Matthew can't resist humor. He can't resist making literature of this, which I believe is the lowliest of the jobs on a newspaper. See? So the reason he's doing this, and whereas he was editing the Constellation, is because he's very hard at work with his second career, or really first career. So uh, we're going to move on now to 1837. This is the Dover Enquirer. I've already presented this. I won't go into it in any great depth. Matthew eloped with his true love, Abby, to Dover from... Um, Haverhill, Massachusetts, and uh, they began writing these letters to the editor under the pseudonym Kappa, Lambda, and Mu, which was symbolic for them and their unborn child when they first started writing. They were writing in response to a 10-page series against abolitionists signed Alpha and Beta, and so they wrote a 10-series rebuttal in favor of abolition. And they're very strong, very hard-hitting. This 
this newspaper contains one example of them, which I've read from before. Um, I won't go into that. Here we have something I've shown before. This is the Liberator. And the reason that I have this, they're, they're not in it very often, but Matthew began publishing his own newspaper, the Monitor, the Salisbury Monitor. Salisbury's right near Amesbury, where they were living, because they got run out of Dover, see, for their anti-slavery work. Um, and they went back to Amesbury, where the other Whittiers had moved to. Uh, I think they had poor housing in with the mill workers. At least that's what my past life memory tells me. And he began this newspaper, The Monitor. You can find it online, the auction in which the only volume in the world apparently was sold for about $7,000, along with some of John Greenleaf Whittier's works. Um, and it's been squirreled away. Whoever bought that had to have been an individual. No institution would have paid that much money for it. He has stuck it somewhere in a vault and he won't release it, See, meaning he won't allow anybody to copy it. He won't uh, release copies of it to scholars. It's been, it's disappeared off the map. But my only consolation is if somebody paid $7,000, he probably will take pretty good care of it just because of that, see. Um, anyway, you can find it online. It's on Bonham's Auction House. If you search Salisbury Monitor, Whittier or Matthew Whittier or any, any of those combinations, you'll come up with it still online. You can see two of the front pages. Some of those pieces were reprinted in other papers and mostly in the Liberator. So this one happens to have a reprinted um, review that Matthew did of an anti-slavery talk. And I told you that Matthew later worked as a reviewer of talks. So that was one of his first ones, and it's in the Liberator. Now... I was 37. We're going to jump forward to 1845. I have said that Matthew Franklin Whittier was writing as the star in the New York Tribune. This is a daily. I have one daily and a whole bunch of weeklies. He started in, I think it was November of 1844. The last one was the middle of 1846 when he left for New Orleans to write for the Daily Delta in New Orleans, where he did basically the same kind of work as he did for the New York Transcript, the blotter. And he wrote them the same way. Um, I've talked a lot about the Tribune, so I won't go into that. Those star-signed articles in the Tribune are Matthew Franklin Whittier's. Only a handful could be uh, Margaret Fuller's as the literary editor. There's the weekly. Um, the rest of them are all Matthew Franklin Whittier signing with a pseudonym he had used since 1830, the star, for reasons I've explained recently. Um, I think right below my finger there is one of the examples. There's another one here. The Weekly tended to have uh, two or three of them ganged together. Now... So he was writing for the, uh, for the Daily Delta, but then he also appears in the chronotype, the weekly chronotype edited by the radical anti-slavery uh, Elijah Wright, who was a personal friend of both of the Whittier brothers. Here's another example of what uh, a slightly earlier version of the chronotype looked like. You can see the train. I think, yeah, you can. I'll get it to where you can see it. Here we go. He was very much interested in progress. One of Elijah Wright's particular ideas was he wanted to introduce something called phonotype, which was phonetic spelling. He wanted to try to, to gradually move his readers over from English to phonotype. And Matthew was advising him against it. I mean, there's no way that his entire readership was going to learn phonotype. <laughs> Matthew wrote in it a few times. But at one point he protested, he says the very, especially when you're talking about like anti-slavery, you know, news and anti-slavery articles, the very people that most need to read that are not going to bother to learn phonotype, you know, kind of obvious. There's a lot that goes in with the chronotype, very radical stuff. Matthew, of course, under pseudonyms, was permitted to write the most radical stuff that he possibly could or wanted to. In almost all the other papers, even in the Portland transcript, which was liberal, he still had to, you know, disguise 
you know, what he was doing, disguise his satire. It's kind of like if you can imagine uh, Lee Camp, who is hired by one of the mainstream networks, and suddenly he has to really tone down, you know, his sarcasm and his language and everything else. But on uh, Redacted Tonight, on RT, he can just let loose. See, well, that's the way Matthew was in the chronotype. He could just let loose. Now, even before he left the New York Tribune, a little bit before, Matthew was also signing as the asterisk, doing very much the same kind of thing in The Odd Fellow. And Matthew was a member of The Odd Fellows. This is the Boston newspaper, Odd Fellow. And he wrote for them. He wrote with his star signature, just like he had been doing in the New York Tribune. And most of it is announcements about meetings of lodges, you know. But there's a few little reviews of the theater and things like that in Boston with this signature. In this one, June 23, 1847, there is also a reprint of one of his pieces for the Daily Delta. Now, in 1846, Matthew signed those with his middle initial F, just as he had done in the first two volumes of the dial back in 1840, 1841. He'd been signing F. Those are not Margaret Fuller. Those are Matthew signing F, just as he did in the Daily Delta. You're getting a sense of the pattern here. But in 1847, they were unsigned. I think because he was undercover doing anti-slavery work as a liaison, down there in New Orleans, and it was very important for him not to be discovered. So at some point, he thought it was a little too dangerous to sign with his initial, like he'd been doing. But I'll read a little bit of this just to give you an idea of the kind of work he was doing. It's, it's the same, same style as he was using back in 1834 and 35 for the New York transcript. Luke Lighthead, or The Effects of the Illumination, and this is attributed to the New Orleans Delta. Late last night, a man was taken up for endeavoring to make a personal illumination of himself in St. Charles Street. He struck a little tin machine full of camphene in his shirt bosom by way of a breast pin and had a couple of apermacetti candles in each of his vest pockets. From one of the patriotic, quote, doggeries on the levee, he had obtained a very ragged, quote, bar-bangled spanner, Matthew reversed it, and cutting armholes through it, walked up and down the street with all the pride of Joseph when he first put on his, quote, coat of many colors. The watchman who arrested him thought in the first place that he was crazy, but Luke Lighthead soon demonstrated to the contrary. Luke thus addressed Charlie, who by this time had come up, come up with him, quote, I ain't been doing nothing, quote, You've been kicking up a bobbery, trying to set yourself on fire and keeping the attention of people away from the illumination. It's no such thing. I got up illumination on my own hook. Taint me, Charlie. It's patriotism. I couldn't stand it no longer. The firing, them cannons, and the blazing of the lamps, and the general enthusiasm carried me right off my feet. Oh, if I was only the St. Louis or Hewlett's Exchange, a steamboat, or even a flatboat, anything that I could hang lamps on, I'd consider myself a made man. I'd put a lantern on my head and hang a pair of sconces to my ears. I'd drill a hole through my nose and carry, in a, carry a blazing balloon by a piece of rope yarn. <laughs> you, you notice the dialect that Matthew throws into this. So this is Matthew Franklin Whittier, and it's reproduced in the newspaper he was also writing for, The Odd Fellow. That's 18, June 1847. Here we have the June 16, 1849 Boston Weekly Museum. This is the poem in which Matthew wrote a travelogue called Quails, which scholars have mistakenly assumed was written by entertainer Ash and Dodge. I definitely disproved that. Um, here you see Daniel Webster. I've also described how Quails met with Daniel Webster about a month after the Fugitive Slave Act went into law. Matthew was working as a secret agent, believe it or not, for William Lloyd Garrison, one of many. He was a liaison, but uh, he was very astute. So I think it's very much to Matthew's credit that uh, William Lloyd Garrison would have sent Matthew to talk 
to and argue with Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster was instrumental in the passing the Fugitive Slave Law, Slave Act. There's a lot to Matthew's participation in the Boston Museum. For one thing, he goes overseas and writes his quail overseas where he meets with Victor Hugo and uh, beautiful writing, you know, magnificent writing. So, so good that, again, scholars couldn't stand the vacuum. They had to attribute it to somebody. And even people at the time were so impressed with it, they had to figure out who it was. And finally, they decided it was Ash and Dodge, and, and Matthew could not expose himself because he was undercover. But he left some pretty broad hints, even though he played along with it, jokingly played along with it. At the same time, he left some pretty clear hints that it was not Ash and Dodge, that it was himself. For one thing, he has quails, as I've said in one of the uh, earlier entries, he has quails meeting Ethan Spike. This is at a time before anybody knew that he was writing Ethan Spike. <laughs> So he left posterity a nice message. Now we come to the carpet bag, which I've talked about many times. This is what the carpet bag looked like. Very difficult to get hold of one of these. I have the whole first volume, but I also have a few individual copies. You can't tell what the date is until you go into it, because for quite a few of these, he didn't put the date on the cover. He put it on the inside where the editor holds forth. And you have to get into it to find out what the date is. This is September 13, 1851. The carpet bag started in the spring of 1851. It went for uh, three years. It went until two years, really. It went until 1853. But then in 1853, when they ran out of cash, they went to a little pocket-sized edition. And I'm going to get up and get them and edit out the uh, interval because I have a couple copies of that, which I'll show you. Okay, here we have the pocket carpet bag. I've got two editions of it. It looks like this. And on the back, it looks like that. They're, they're positioned, the covers are positioned oppositely. <laughs> and these two, I think some it fell off and somebody pasted it back on backwards, I think, but I'm not going to mess with it. Matthew Franklin Whittier has no presence whatsoever in either of these two. They're, I forget what the dates are, but they're early in, in, uh, in the year. These things, this one is April 1853. This is what the front page of it looks like. Uh, it took me years to get these. There's, there's at least two more that show up. One of them is, I think it was given away at a trade show, basically. I forget what the, what the trade was, but it was given away at the trade show. I think it had like the, uh, you know, it had the, the schedule, I think, inside. And then it had a bunch of little standalone cartoons, which I think were originally Matthews. I, I have uh, copies of them, but they're, they're not in here. And then there's a December edition. The only copy I know of exists at the American Antiquarian Society. My researcher photographed it for me. It has the only thing it's got in it, and there's no back cover, so I don't know if there was more after that, but the only thing it has in it is a Christmas story, unsigned, which Abby had written, and Matthew had published in, I think it was a January 1853 edition, uh, posthumously, you know, for her. Most of the pieces that Matthew published posthumously for Abbey were in the Boston uh, Weekly Museum. But this one, A Christmas Story, ended up in the carpet bag, and it ended up reprinted in the very last little pocket carpet bag. So I think it was like a promise to Abbey or a tribute to her that he would publish her story in book form, and this was the only way he was able to do it. That I don't know for sure, but I know that that's the last. So Matthew was the first on the very first page of the first edition of the carpet bag when it first came out in 1851. And he got the last word because uh, reprinting of Abby's story was the last. In between, he came in for an awful lot of trouble because uh, 
in the carpet bag. People imitated him. There was an awful lot of political infighting. A lot of them were conservatives, so there was an awful lot of infighting along political, ideological lines. They forced him out, I think, eventually, or tried to muzzle him and eventually forced him out. And in my opinion, that's why that paper finally folded, because the imitators just didn't have his spirit, you know. So we're going to move on. There's an awful lot more to the carpet bag. My gosh, I could sit here and talk about the carpet bag all day. This is Gleason's Pictorial. This happens to be the June 17th, 1854 edition of Gleason's Pictorial. It was a well-funded magazine. Um published by Frederick Gleason. Matthew never submitted to this magazine. I have this copy because it has a an etching of the steamship that he went to Europe on, writing his quails. So somewhere in here is that they all look the same. It's a picture of the American, which is the one that he went on. But a lot of Matthew's work ended up in this because it contains Francis A. Duravage's stolen Stories, the stories that, that Duravage tricked Matthew out of by getting him to sign a bogus contract, as I have extrapolated. So when Francis Duravage and George Burnham got together and tricked Matthew out of the rights to his entire unpublished portfolio, quite a bit of it signed by Duravage or signed under the pseudonym The Olden, which was Matthew's phrase, ended up in Gleason's pictorial. A lot of it ended up in Frederick uh, Gleason's other publication in Boston at the time, The Flag of Our Union, which I haven't been able to get hold of a copy of that. They're pretty rare for some reason, although I think it was popular at the time. These got saved because they had these magnificent illustrations. This was basically a picture, you know, a picture magazine where you go through and look at the pictures and, you know, if they were lucky, you might read a couple of the articles. So uh, the... The uh, next quote-unquote incarnation of Gleason's was Balu's, Maturin Balu, I believe his name was. This is Balu's pictorial, which comes in, I think, 1855. And, um, oh, here's the Great Eastern. I read to you an article in which Matthew, signing as the star in the New York Weekly Tribune, Daily and Weekly Tribune, writes that he visited the Great Eastern at Dock. And I just told you, I think it was in yesterday's entry, or the one before, that it was extremely unlikely that Margaret Fuller would have gone into the engine room of the Great Eastern. Well, there is the Great Eastern. <laughs> but uh, by the time Martur and Balu took over this paper, he hired Francis Duravage as an associate editor. So Duravage got an editorship, a real plum of a job, by claiming Matthew's work for all these years. And in the very first edition of Balu's, they start serializing one of Matthew's novels that uh, Duravage had not yet published. He started immediately serializing when he became the associate editor of Balu's. Now, there's something I missed in 1848 that I wanted to share, and this is really fragile. This is 1848, Douglas Jarrell's newspaper. I had previously mistakenly called it J Douglas Jarrell's Illustrated Magazine or something. I think you can read the spine, Jarrell's weekly newspaper. For some reason, American newspapers were using rag, I think, and the British newspapers weren't. So these things are really fragile. They, they um, chip off, you know. You touch a page and a corner chips off. But in the April edition, we have an Ethan Spike story. Um, I'll get a close-up shot of it. I won't hold it up to the camera. And I'll read just the beginning portion of this. What had happened is they had reprinted a, a, an excerpt from one of his other Ethan Spike stories. And so he decided that since they'd published an excerpt, he would send them an Ethan Spike letter. A Yankee letter to Mr. Douglas Gerald, Esquire, England, I-N-G-L-A-N-D, London, L-U-N-D-U-N. Dear Sir, D-E-E-R, Sir, seeing as you printed part of one of my letters to Mr. Wright of the Boston Chronotype, 
into your paper, I kinder venture to send you one, send one to you right straight. It makes me feel sort of awkward to be writing to a Britisher, seeing as I'm interpendent, democratic, Republican. But as none of our folks here would touch an English paper more than they'd touch Pison, they'd never know about it. Now that's P-I-S-O-N. So when I did a, ran a search about how many times Matthew used P-I-S-E-N and P-I-Z-E-N, I missed the ones where he spelled it P-I-S-O-N. <laughs> there were plenty anyway. They'll never know nothing about it. So here goes, as Uncle Joshua said, when he killed himself a drink and two quarts of whiskey on a wager. <laughs> this is Ethan Spike. And it goes on, you know, in a, in a prejudiced vein against the British, you know. Uh, so the, the whole point of that is just to establish that definitely, with no question whatsoever, Matthew Franklin Whittier was published overseas by 1848. And the reason that's important is I've claimed that he sent work uh, for Elizabeth Barrett Browning to look at, which she immediately published as her own, and that one other piece, which I presented recently about the A Night with the Industrious Fleas, which is signed Pierre Shafton, was also Matthews. So definitely there was some involvement that Matthew had with Europe. Okay, And I can prove it here as of 1848. Douglas Gerald was friends... Um, in the close circle with Charles Dickens and with William Makepeace Thackeray, I've already talked about how there's uh, a story about Matthew having dinner with William Makepeace Thackeray. Now, Matthew continues to publish in the uh, Portland Transcript and other papers, but we're just looking at the ones I have copies of. We're going to move all the way up to 1862. This is Vanity Fair. Near as I can tell, it's an extremely conservative publication. Uh, Charles Farrer Brown, who wrote Artemis Ward, who was kind of uh, one of Matthew's protégés, possibly, wrote, edited for this paper. That may be how Matthew ended up being involved in it. At this time, he was working for the Boston Custom House, he basically retired in the Boston Custom House. This is right smack in the middle of the war. But this contains, as I have uh, shared with you in one of my earliest video blogs, contains Matthew's open letter to President Lincoln as Ethan Spike. So um, there's a pretty significant, a pretty significant uh, historical uh, value to that one. I've got two copies of this. So there's not too much more to say since I've already presented that. So... Uh, these aren't all of them. There's a few minor ones that Matthew published in, maybe once or twice or three times or whatever, or was reprinted in that I haven't touched on. I also haven't really touched on the, the bound volumes that I have, with the exception of Douglas Gerald's newspaper. But that gives you a general idea, a general overview of Matthew's career through the newspapers that I have here physically. It's a fascinating look back through time for me, I can't explain what I feel. I feel an excitement when I handle those things. What I feel was Matthew felt that he was doing something significant and that he was reaching a great many people and it was exciting for him. It was exciting and it was fun and he put a lot of mystery into it, you know, and a lot, a lot of mischief into them, as well as the serious work, you know, anti-slavery work he was doing. And I can feel that. And oddly enough, when I really feel it is when I smell them, because a lot of those American publications that had rag paper have a particular smell to them. And boy, is that evocative. And that's about all I can say. I can't tell you what it feels like. I can just tell you it's very evocative and very poignant. And I know that. You know, like in Jurassic Park, where uh, Alex, you know, the, the girl knows the Unix system, you know, she says, I know that. I know this. You know, well, that's the way I feel when I smell those papers and smell that, that scent. So Matthew had quite an outreach, but it was all anonymous. I mean, he touched an awful lot of people with these works. Ethan Spike, he became famous more for when somebody outed him in 1857. 
and that destroyed his career. He was blacklisted, as near as I could tell after that. But he became famous for Ethan Spike. Uh, he's been forgotten by this time. But all these other things that he did that nobody knew who they were written by or that scholars latched on to the wrong author and, and attributed them because they couldn't resist or somebody couldn't resist. You know, maybe if three scholars resisted uh, attributing them, the fourth scholar wanted to get published and he didn't resist, you know. So they attributed them to all the wrong people like Ash and Dodge and any number of others. And then a few of them claimed them outright because, as I said, when they started to get really popular, like quails, they, people started to say, well, who's, who's doing that? Who's doing that? And somebody decided it was Ash and Dodge. And then, that, and then the editor and Dodge himself picked that up and claimed it. So he kept hinting more and more broadly until finally at the end of the run of the, of the Boston Weekly Museum, the editor comes right out and says that quails was Ash and Dodge. And it was a lie, you know. And you have to remember when you look at history that there's a certain percentage of liars and a certain percentage of these lies ended up in history and got accepted as truth, you know, a lot more than what we think. I'm gauging from the little piece of history, my little corner that I'm studying is so full of lies that I've busted. It must be a huge problem for historians that some of them may be aware of and some of them may be, just be swallowing these things because seems to me that there's good scholars and bad ones. And the bad ones are content to write their thesis and their dissertation and their books by just going back and looking at secondary sources and just taking it, their word for it, just taking it at face value. Oh, so-and-so says that Joe Strickland was, you know, written by so-and-so, and, -so, and that's, that's what I'm going to put down as fact. So the first guy says, I think so. The second guy says... The first guy thinks so, and the third guy says it's fact, and everybody after the third guy says it's fact. <laughs> I noticed something very interesting in the comments when I talk about Edgar Allan Poe, is that there were people that tried to expose Edgar Allan Poe, and they have been discredited. Poe himself, of course, vehemently denied these things, and but history as a whole has come in behind that, and the scholars have taken Poe's side and marginalized or discredited the people that were trying to expose him. You know, so-and-so tried to criticize Poe, but he didn't know what he was talking about. He was, you know, a fake. They've all been marginalized. But they were right, and Poe was, was a sociopath. You know, this is what I found from my little corner of the research. Poe was really a, a phony, an imposter, literary imposter, who stole other people's work and then set himself up as a critic to make it look like he was on their level or above them a little bit, which he wasn't. And that everybody believes his own personal myth that he created, which is very, it's like quicksand. It's very amorphous if you try to get into it. And scholars know that, you know, but they still believe him. And I think the reason is, <clears throat> I'm just guessing how this could happen. The people that spent the most time and published the most on Edgar Allan Poe were his fans. The people that, that saw through him and realized he was an imposter and a, and a plagiarist were not fans. The fans got published more. They, they spent more time studying Poe's life. They wrote more. They published more. And their voice, <clears throat> their voice was louder. Therefore, they won. Yeah. So history was written by the fans. They say history is written by the victors. In this case, I think history is written by the fans, meaning the history that predominates. This is just a theory coming off the top of my head, but I think I'm right. So when anybody challenges Charles Dickens, the great Charles Dickens, or anybody char challenges the great Edgar Allan Poe, the fans rush in and swamp them and discredit them and marginalize them. So now you have people who comment on my videos and comment on my other postings and say, oh, you know, we all know that this critic of Poe has been discredited, you know, and tried to, you know, tried to trash Poe, but it, it wasn't real and it wasn't fair and he's been discredited. And we all know that, that uh, this illustrator who said that Charles Dickens stole his ideas 
for Oliver Twist or for some of the other things, that they were just, uh, you know, making it all up, that uh, they've been discredited. But near as I can tell, the critics were correct. And these people were scoundrels and plagiarists, and they did not write the best of their work at all. So, uh, I mean, you know, I didn't start out saying that, but this is what has come up in my research. You know, so when I claim that Matthew Franklin Whittier and Abby were the original co-authors of A Christmas Carol, and this seems like a ludicrous, ridiculous thing. What I'm trying to show is that it's not ludicrous at all. It's not unexpected at all. It's not strange. Because on the one hand, I've got Matthew and Abby's hidden literary legacy, which shows that they could very well have written this story. And then I've got Dickens, on the other hand, who couldn't possibly have written it, if you really see who he was and what he was beyond the plagiarism and beyond his assumption of a of a great social reformer if you cut through all of that and you see who he really was he couldn't possibly have written it so you have matthew and abby's plausible authorship on the one hand and charles dickens impossible authorship on the other and the same goes with edgar Allan poe edgar Allan poe was not a religious man okay and he published a number of religious poems they don't even agree in their philosophy, you know, one of them is a spiritualist and another one just as clearly sets forth the traditional Christian idea of the resurrection. And there's no indication in the history that Poe went through any kind of personal revolution. It's impossible he could have written those two poems. It's impossible. So the only answer is that he had a very nasty habit of stealing the unpublished grief poetry of widowers, of unknown widowers. <laughs> he didn't care if they were spiritualists. He didn't care if they believed in the resurrection. It didn't matter to him. You know, he wasn't even religious. So if he wasn't religious, he couldn't, if he wasn't a spiritual man, he couldn't possibly have published The Raven. The poem, The Raven, philosophically and spiritually is roughly parallel to C.S. Lewis's A Grief Observed. It's a deeply religious person who's having a terrible faith crisis and writes about it. And for the moment, for that particular time in his life, it seems as though death wins, which is why you have the raven sitting on top of the bust of palace, the bust of palace. I have a bust of palace, by the way, up here that I bought from Greece. It's carved in alabaster. Um, it, the raven sits on the bust of palace, not the reason that Edgar Allan Poe says in a philosophy of composition, because you want contrast between the black feathers and the white alabaster. <laughs> Give me a break. It sits on uh, the bust of Pallas, who is Athena, because Athena is the goddess of wisdom. And she represents everything that Abby had taught Matthew about mysticism and the other world. But the raven, who represents death, sits on top of Pallas as though the fact of physical death has conquered all of the wisdom that Abby had taught him. So, I don't know what to say about that. It's like, it's so obvious to me. The whole thing is so obvious. Poe displayed his ignorance in the philosophy of composition for all to see because he had the opportunity there to talk about what was really in that poem if he had actually understood it, which he didn't. You know, to him, it was just an intellectual exercise. Some people have said that that philosophy of composition was tongue in cheek. But if it was, what was he making fun of? You know, to me, he just comes off ignorant, spiritually ignorant. He was faking it. In other words, this guy is a fake. He's, a, he's an imposter. So he was faking having written The Raven. And he wrote that whole essay not about composition. It was just an excuse to pretend to tell people how he had written The Raven to help seal his authorship of the thing. Because I think by that time it was starting to get away from him. People were starting to question if he could possibly have written it, which he couldn't have. And to the fans of Edgar Allan Poe, I'm sorry, you know, but this guy is going to disappear in a puff of smoke because there's nothing to him <laughs> except for maybe the horror stories, you know. And I don't know how many of those he stole because he stole some words 
with a mummy from Matthew Franklin Whittier. I'm sure of it. He reworked it completely, but that's Matthew's concept. It was one of many satires on quack medicine that Matthew wrote over the years, including for the Boston Weekly Museum. He'd written one earlier, The uh, Life and Adventures of Dr. Dodemus Duckworth, Duckworth. So it was just one in the series for him. And the clever idea was one of many for him. So if Poe stole that prose piece, how many other prose pieces did he steal? What I would suggest is where you have been, or I'm talking to the Poe fans, where you have been dismissing all the critics of Poe, step back and try an intellectual exercise. Try believing them all, all of them, all the critics of Poe, try believing them and just see what happens. What happens to Poe if they're all correct? You know, I think that's going to be a lot closer to the truth than the other way around. Well, I hope somebody has found this of interest or someday will find this of interest. Again, what I hope will happen, aside from the, we have maybe 16 people that watch the ones where I talk about famous authors and maybe five that talk about these tours through my library and so on. Uh, five people that view these talks through my library. And uh, I hope that someday there'll be a little museum for Matthew and there'll be a little room where you can go in and watch these. You know, maybe they'll even play them for a little audience. will come into the theater room and, you know, maybe 20 or 30 people will sit down and watch these. And I'll be long gone, but at least they'll have Stephen Sacalarius to talk to them and they'll get to know me a little bit and how I stumbled and was absent-minded and couldn't remember things in front of the camera and all these wonderful, other wonderful things about me. Um, so we'll see. Uh, anyway, once again, thanks for watching.